There we go. If you can't hear me okay or see me or see my slides or anything like that, please just let me know in the chat. And we have an assignment, one that was finished yesterday at 1130 or something like that. Thanks, Mohammed. Glad to see everything's working out. Uh, the next assignment has gone live and I sent an email about that this week. It's going to be due in the regular Tuesday slot. This one's a quick one, only 10 questions and some of them are pretty quick. Uh, so it's on the sort of beginning part of this equilibrium chapter. And it's short because we missed a class and it's also um, obviously you don't have a full week to do that one. So hopefully that's not a big deal. And we will finish this chapter off in time for the following subsequent uh, assignment. We do have a midterm coming up. The midterm is March 3rd and um, I'll send some more info around that um, closer to the time. So it'll cover probably at least uh, the first four units, which were kinetics, thermo one, thermo two, and now equilibrium. And what else? Next Wednesday, I've lined it up next Wednesday that anybody who's um, physically present, you know, or, or can make themselves physically present, um, we're going to have a field trip. And the field trip isn't going to be super far. It's going to be at the a lab, the Acadia lab for agri food and beverage. And um, we're going to get a tour. We're going to get a look at a lot of sort of really super high end uh, analytical equipment and chemistry, the sort of equipment that you may end up using if you have a career in uh, chemical analysis, for example, or if you're maybe a co op student and interested in taking a job at the A lab or really anywhere else. They have equipment. That's it's uh, while it is state of the art and high end and all that kind of stuff. It is also the same sort of equipment that you might expect to find uh, in, a, in an actual industry setting. So that I think will be maybe a nice change from the usual lectures that we're doing in the course, uh, give you a bit of exposure to something new. And what I will do is create a poll in Acorn. And the purpose of the poll is to see who is able to physically come. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the limits of how many are able to do the tour and I'm going to try to set it up so that if you can't come in person, you can still get, I guess, like a virtual tour. Um, but I'll let you know when that happens. I think our limit might be like five. So, yeah. I want everyone to be able to go who can go. So maybe if there's people who uh, more people wanting to go than we have space for we can do maybe a second run of it sometime. Um, OK, so we spent a lot of time so far talking about equilibrium. We described equilibrium situations uh, using thermodynamic parameters, namely delta G. We said that if you have a, a reaction where the delta G is zero, meaning there's no driving force to go either forwards or backwards, that describes an equilibrium situation. Um, we also describe delta G zero, which is the delta G of a system that e has everything in their standard states, which means one molar for, for dissolved substances, one uh, bar for gases. And we can relate the delta G zero of a reaction to the equilibrium constant K. So there's this sort of connection. In other words, maybe what we could say is the equilibrium constant K and delta G zero are measures of the exact same thing. They're telling us the driving force for this reaction to lie towards products or lie towards reactants. Um, we're going to move through the next bit, I think fairly quickly because um, I know you've seen this before. This is using doing equilibrium calculations using what we call ice tables. Uh, we did this in first semester when we did acids and bases, and um, I think most people probably do this in high school as well. What we're going to be using is equilibrium constant K, our expression of the equilibrium constant involving concentrations of products and reactants, and a little bit of math and see if we can use K to find some things out for us. So here's an example where we have a study of carbon oxidation. We have a reaction between carbon dioxide and graphite, which is in equilibrium with two 
moles of CO2. And we're told that in a study of carbon oxidation, an evacuated vessel containing a small amount of powdered graphite is heated to 1080 K. Gas, gas phase CO2, gaseous CO2 is added to a pressure of 0.458 bar and then CO then forms. At equilibrium, the total pressure is 0.757 K. Calculate K, okay, 75 bar. So what we're gonna do is set up a bit of an ice table here underneath. Uh, pencil, wake up. Just hold up here one second. Pencil is not obeying me at the moment. I'm gonna force it to. Hmm, I need a pencil for what I'm going to be doing here. Just hold on one sec. Great, she woke up. Okay, my pencil's working, now QuickTime isn't. Uh, all fixable, sorry about the delay. Okay, good. We are alive once again. All right, so here we go. We want to do an ICE. There we go. So ICE stands for initial change and equilibrium. And so what we want to do here is put in our initial pressures, our change as a result of this shifting, and then whatever the equilibrium pressures might be. So initially, we have um, CO2 added at 0.458 bar. bar. And we don't have a pressure for graphite because it's a solid. Solids don't aren't don't have a pressure. Um, they also don't appear in the equilibrium expression because it's a pure solid, has an activity of one. And CO initially is zero. So what's gonna happen is this equilibrium is going to shift to produce some products. So some of the CO2 is going to disappear. So we can put a minus X here. And then some amount of CO is going to be generated and we can say this is plus 2x because we get two moles of CO for every mole of CO2 uh, that disappears. So at equilibrium, we're at 0 0.458 bar and for CO2, and we're at 2x bar for CO. So our total pressure, P total, we're told is 0 0.757 bar given in the question. And that's gonna be equal to the pressure of CO2 plus the pressure of CO at equilibrium, which is equal to 0 0.458, no, I made a mistake there, didn't I? 458 minus X. Bar plus 2X 
bar, which equals 0 0.458 plus x. So we could solve for x here. x is going to be equal to 0 0.299 bar. So what that allows us to now do is go back to our in initial uh, equilibrium expression, and we can put in those concentrations. Okay. And so if we do that, that 0.458 minus 0.299 is equal to um, 0 0.159 bar. And 2x is 2 times 0 0.299 is equal to 0 0.598 bar. Great. So we have our equilibrium pressures. Now we need to, to find k. I'm going to do this up in the top right. k is equal to um, be the pressure of CO squared over the pressure of CO2 equals 0.598 squared over 0.159. Notice I left units out here. Uh, we don't put units into the equilibrium expression. And this becomes 2.25. So that's it. That's our equilibrium constant for this particular reaction. Um, I want to show you another one. And this one is, it's interesting. And this is something we, we, we did back when we did acids and bases, where we had this simplifying assumption is what we called it. So we have in this reaction COCl2, which is also called phosgene, which is a funny name for it because there's no phosphorus in it. But anyway, that's the name, COCl2. Uh, is in equilibrium with carbon monoxide and Cl2 gas. And the K is equal to 8.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Just looking at that number, what we can probably say about that is that K is very small, a lot smaller than 1. That means the delta G0 for this reaction is going to be a positive value. Uh, both of those mean that this reaction is going to heavily favor reactants. That when this comes to equilibrium, you're going to have a lot more reactants than you do products. Um, calculate the equilibrium partial pressures of carbon monoxide Cl2 and COCl2. When we start out with 0 0.30 bar of phosgene gas, um, and it's allowed to decompose and reach equilibrium. So what I'm going to do is pop over into my new app. I'm going to draw out the equation again. COCl2 gas in equilibrium with... Uh, CO gas plus Cl2 gas. And we're told initially that we have a partial pressure of phosgene of 0 0.300 bar. Uh, a good question is what do you do if you're given a, a different unit? Well, what you should do is change everything to bar before you get started. If you start with atmospheres or kilopascals or something like that, uh, because equilibrium constants are defined in units of bar. Even though we don't put units in, you need to put the pressures in uh, as if they were bar. And initially we have zero of these two. So the change is this is going to shift to the right, produce a small amount of product. So it's going to be minus x over here, plus x, plus x. And then at equilibrium, we have 0 0.300 minus x, x, and x. And we could say that our equilibrium constant k, which is provided in the question, 8.3 times 10 to the minus 4, unitless, is equal to the pressure of CO times pressure of Cl2 over the pressure of COCl2 which is equal to x, x, 0 0.300 minus x um, equals 8.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, we can run through this equation. We can run through this calculation without too much trouble. Um, you'd have to multiply it through. 
you'd end up with a quadratic equation. You could put that into the quadratic formula and the quadratic formula allows you to solve for X and that would give you the partial pressures of CO, Cl2 and our starting material. So you, you've done this type of uh, question, problem many times in the acid bases unit. Um, and I just want to remind you at this point, I don't want to go through the entire question again, but I, I do want to remind you that there's a simplifying assumption that you can sometimes make, but you always have to check. Okay. And the simplifying assumption is basically that this can be instead of expressed as X squared over just 0 0.300, 8.3 times 10 to the minus four. So what we're assuming with this simplifying assumption is that that X is going to be small relative to the 0.3 that it's subtracted from, uh, such that we can kind of ignore it, which greatly simplifies the math because then you don't have a quadratic function anymore. Well, it is quadratic, but you can just take a square root of both sides and that allows you to solve for X a lot quicker than using the quadratic formula. However, this isn't always valid. That assumption that X is small relative to 0.3 uh, works sometimes, but it doesn't always work. So it can get you in trouble. You always rely on that particular assumption. So we have um, a way to check. And the way to check is you take the number. So the I'll just uh, put this here. We'll say this to check. What we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to take the concentration or pressure initial. Whatever your initial thing is basically this number that you're subtracting X from, and we're going to divide that by the K value. And we want to check and see if that number is larger or smaller than 400. And 400 is, is I guess, it's, it's a cutoff that we're going to use. If this value is greater than 400, then what we can say is that that assumption is, is a good assumption, that that X will be a small number. X will be small when it is small or the initial number is very large. So that's why we have this equation right here. 400 was sort of plucked out of the air, really. You may have seen this before in high school where we use maybe 500 or maybe use 1,000 or things like that. Um, 400 is the number that you can use safely if you're using two significant figures. And especially in acid base reactions, we typically don't use more than two sig figs because pH meters can't measure better than two sig figs. Um, so we're going to use 400. If you wanted three sig figs, then you might need to use 1,000 instead as your cutoff. But we're going to use 400. So in this particular question that we're working on, we can check, we can take 0 0.300, which is our initial pressure of our COCl2, divided by K, which is 8.3 times 10 to the minus four. And when we do that calculation, we end up getting 361. So that 361 is clearly less than 400. And what that means then is the this simplifying assumption is a bad one. So that means no. Assumption. And when this happens, your heart sinks a little bit because that means it's going to be a little bit more math to get to your answer. Um, so what that means is we can't do that simplification. So our uh, equation is going to remain x squared over 0 0.300 minus x equals 8.3 times 10 to the minus 4. So we could run that through um, the quadratic formula, calculate for x, and there we go. Uh, what we'll end up getting is our final pressure of COCl2 is 0 0.285 bar. Our pressure of CO is equal to our pressure of CL2 equals 0 0.015 bar. So yeah, small amounts of products relative to our starting compound, but uh, 
significant enough, you know, it's significant enough that we can't just make this assumption over here without changing our final answer. So that simplifying assumption, uh, you should be aware of it for sure and make sure that uh, you check before you just jump in and make that assumption with these kinds of questions. There we go. Um, we're going to be looking now at Le Chatelier's principle, which is something I think you have seen before, probably in high school. Basically, what Le Chatelier's principle says is that if you have a system that's equal at equilibrium and you disrupt that equilibrium somehow by making some change, and that change can be in the form of adding or removing reactants or products, you could change the temperature, you could increase or decrease the pressure, you could expand it. Um, there's all sorts of different things you could potentially do to disrupt a system at equilibrium. Le Chatelier's principle says that the system will respond by shifting to the right or to the left in a way that undoes the change that you made. So if you add a bunch of starting material to an equilibrium, it will shift to the right to use up that starting material you added. It, it tries to mitigate the, the change that you put on it. Um, okay, so generally speaking, you could say that any equilibrium is basically reactants in equilibrium with products. And yeah, so if you change the concentration of either reactant or product, let's say we increase the concentration of the reactant, that means the equilibrium will shift to the right, produce more products, and use up those additional reactants that you threw in. So usually when we do a chemical reaction, what we want to do is push it towards products. We want maximum yields of products if we can get it. Uh, so one way to do that is increase the concentration of reactants or a reactant that can push it closer to the right. Um, or another way to do it is remove product as it's being generated. And this is a, a common strategy as well, that if you can remove the product as it's being formed, you can have this reaction shift further and further to the right. So what does that actually mean to remove product as it's formed? Um, here, I'll give you an example. If you have CH3, CH2, CH2, COOH, that's called butyric acid. And we react this with CH3, CH2, CH2OH, which is one propanol in the presence of an acid catalyst, this will make in equilibrium CH3, CH2, CH2, COO, CH2, CH2, CH3, which is really ugly looking. Although if you draw bond line structures, and I think when you did uh, um, Lewis structures in first semester, um, did you guys do um, bond line format? where you you know you could redraw that starting molecule as something like this yes no maybe it's kind of a cleaner way of drawing the same thing yes great um so this is uh an equilibrium where we have a carboxylic acid, we have an alcohol, and we're producing an ester plus water. And so this equilibrium can go back and forth. So let's say we want to do this reaction to produce the maximum amount of this ester. Um, what you might recognize is that everything in this reaction, except for that ester, has an OH. We have water, we have an alcohol, and we have butyric acid, which is a carboxylic acid. Um, having an alcohol, an OH, having an OH on the molecule allows it to do hydrogen bonding, which causes it to have a high boiling point. So everything here is a high boiling point except for that ester. And so if, if you're doing a reaction like this, the way you can do it is mix everything together in a flask and then have the flask come up And we have what's called a condenser. 
basically this is a cooled um, a cooled sort of sleeve where you can put cold water in one end and cold water comes out the other end and then there's a hollow tube that goes through and then what you could do is put all your reactants mix them all in here etc heat the thing and then as it reacts what can happen is the thing that boils at the lowest temperature which will be your ester can evaporate out condense when it hits this cold sleeve which we call a condenser and then it can run out in drips and you can collect it in a beaker over here uh, so that ester as it's being generated will be condensed and removed from the reaction while everything else stays in the reaction mixture and it stays in there because it's high boiling doesn't evaporate very easily because they have hydrogen bonding this would be an example of an equilibrium situation where you could force it towards completion you could force it towards the product side by removing the product as it's being generated all right so that's a practical example of how you might do this uh, there's actually lots of reactions like this that produce water uh, and there's many different ways of removing water from a reaction as it's being formed. So if you pull the water out too, that's another way to do it. And one way to remove water is if you took the flask and you have all your stuff in there, you can buy these things called molecular sieves. S-I-E-V-E-S or is it S-E-I? Uh, top one looks correct which are basically these little like pellets and they kind of sit in the bottom and these pellets if you were to zoom in on them they have these like little channels little pores all through them and the pores are like super attractive to water molecules so water molecules will go into those pores and get trapped and then effectively removed from the solution so if you do this reaction the same reaction and just like add these molecular sieves to the bottom what that does is as the reaction proceeds you remove the water by trapping it in these molecular sieves and that will cause this reaction to shift to the right and produce more product so that's another way in this particular reaction you might want to maximize the product that you're getting that's just two ways there's lots of other ways to do it uh, another thing you might want to do is really jack up the concentration of one of our reactants and that'll push it towards products as well. You may want to do all of those things to get the maximum amount of product out of a reaction like this. Okay, this is just a, a picture showing the exact same thing. We have a system that's at equilibrium. We have concentrations, or in this case pressures, of three gases that are all constant over time until you disrupt the equilibrium by adding additional amounts of N2 gas. And what happens is the system responds immediately. I mean, well, it takes a little bit of time um, for it to reach equilibrium again. But what happens is the equilibrium, if you increase the amount of N2, will shift to the uh, right. It'll remove some hydrogen gas as it shifts to the right. So you see this one decreases. It increases the amount of NH3 gas, so that one increases, and it decreases the amount of N2. So in other words, the, um, the change that we made to the system was to jack up the N2 pressures, and so the response is to then reduce that change, which is remove N2 from the system. Um, changing the total pressure uh, will not change the value of K. The K is a constant regardless of what pressures you're at. Uh, K does change with temperature, but it does not change with pressure. So if you have a gas phase equilibrium like this and you just compress it or um, remove pressure on it, like if you had a piston here and you moved it up or you moved it down, um, that won't change K, but it will change whatever the equilibrium concentrations are or can change. So in this case, if you, let's say you increase the pressure in, on this particular reaction, um, what will happen is the equilibrium will shift in order to undo that increase in pressure. If you increase the pressure, it will want to shift to try to reduce that 
additional pressure that you added. And the way you would look at this is, is count up the moles of gas on each side of the equation. So NH3 is two moles of gas. On the right, we have one plus three, which is four moles of gas. So if you increase pressure by compressing this, this was going to cause this to shift to the left, which is the side of fewer moles of gas because that will reduce the pressure then that we just increased. So it'll want to reduce whatever change it is that you make. So by compressing it, we're increasing the partial pressures of everything. It'll shift to the left to reduce the total partial, partial pressure. Uh, there we go. Look at that, an animated version of what I just said. Louis Stelier's principle. So we're going to go back to this particular uh, equilibrium that we looked at already earlier in the class, where we have CO2 gas reacting with solid carbon graphite in equilibrium with two moles of carbon monoxide gas. Write the equilibrium expression as we did already. It's going to be the pressure of the product squared because of the two in the balanced equation divided by the pressure of CO2. And we just put pressure straight into this in bar, but we don't include the units, right? Because we're using activities, we're not using pressures, but we're substituting pressures for activities. Uh, okay, so we've done that. What impact would the following situations have on the action equilibrium? More CO is added to the flask. So if we increase the pressure of CO, that's going to cause the reaction to move to the left. We could say shift to left. More graphite is added to the flask. So if we increase the amount of graphite, that actually has no effect on the reaction. Why does it have no effect? We increase the amount of one of the reactants. Well, the reason that increasing the amount of graphite or decreasing the amount of graphite for that matter has no effect is it does not appear in the equilibrium expression. Okay, does not depend on the amount of graphite. Once you have enough graphite to establish this equilibrium, adding more is irrelevant, it doesn't do anything at all. It's almost graphite is solid, yes. Graphite is a nice black powder. Um, so, yeah, it's it's almost like if you have like a, a saturated solution of salt and you have solid salt sitting at the bottom, you can dump more salt in, but that's not going to increase the concentration of dissolved ions. Once it's saturated, it's done. You can't add any more. This is a similar sort of situation where we have this equilibrium that depends only on CO2 and CO, not on graphite. Last is the volume of the reaction vessel is increased. You expand it, expanding is going to decrease the pressure. So what it's going to do is shift to the side that has more moles of gas. So what we would do is look at our species here, count up the moles of gas on the left and the moles of gas on the right. Here we just have one mole of gas. And on the right, we have two moles of gas. So increasing the reaction volume would decrease the pressure, would cause a shift to the right. Okay, it's going to want to shift, undo that change. It's going to want to repressurize or add more pressure after we reduce the pressure. Great, fantastic. Change in temperature. This is especially important. Well, it's all, almost always important, but it's important when you have a reaction that's either exothermic or endothermic. I guess it's possible that you can have a reaction that's thermoneutral, that's not exothermic or endothermic, and then temperature may not have much of an effect. Um, but everything else, which is almost always the case, um, changing the temperature will shift the position of an equilibrium. So th I, I think the easiest way to think about this is to consider heat as a reactant or a product in the chemical reaction. OK, um, so what would an example be? Let's say we have an endothermic reaction where we have A plus B going to C plus D. If it's endothermic, that means it's absorbing heat. 
and we can consider heat almost as being like a reactant. For an exothermic reactant, heat is given off, and we can think of heat as a product. So what this means is that if you increased the temperature of a reaction, if the reaction is exothermic, say we're going to increase temperature, we do that by adding heat. What that's going to do is shift the equilibrium away from the side where heat is present as a product. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just the same as if you increase the concentrations of D or C, it's going to shift it to the left to remove or take away whatever you added. If you have an endothermic reaction and you increase the temperature, what that's going to do is shift the reaction to the right. Okay, so many examples, if you have um, an endothermic reaction, cranking up the temperature, not only will make the reaction faster, but it'll also increase your equilibrium yield, the amount of products that are present once it's reached equilibrium. Exothermic is the opposite. Great, so consider heat a reactant or a product in these examples. Oh, we got some animations, I gotta delete those. Get out of here, get out of here, there we go. Um, we also know that temperature does affect the value of K as well. And we actually have another um, uh, form, we have an equation called the Van't Hoff equation, which we, I guess, can use our delta S0 and delta H0, our standard enthalpy change for reactions um, and products. Sorry. Uh, my phone was in my pocket and was getting like very hot and I'm like, what's going on with my phone? I think the flashlight was on or something. Um, so this is basically just an equation which expresses K in terms of delta S and delta H. This is basically just a rearrangement of two equations we already know. We already know that, uh, um, no, my pen died again. Giving me trouble today. Um, well, I can say this anyway. That equation, the Van't Hoff equation that you see below, ln k is uh, delta s, zero over r, minus delta h, zero over rt. This is basically just a rearrangement of two equations we already know. One is um, delta g, zero equals uh, minus rt ln k. So we've been using that one in this unit to relate k with delta g, zero. The other one is delta G zero equals delta H zero minus T delta S zero. That's the Gibbs equation that we were using in the previous chapter. If you kind of put those two equations together, you end up with the Van't Hoff equation that you see below. So really, I mean, I guess Van't Hoff came along. He, he, this is kind of low hanging fruit, I guess, just combine two existing equations. And now you got your own equation with your name after it. This is a different form of the Van't Hoff equation, which is probably more useful, at least in the context that we want to use it in. Um, this basically looks at how the equilibrium constant for a reaction will change if you go from one temperature to another temperature. So the ln of K2 over K1 is the minus uh, equals negative delta H0 of reaction over R. R is a gas constant times one minus T2, uh, one over T2 minus one over T1. So what this allows us to do is that if we know the equilibrium constant at any temperature, we can then predict what that equilibrium constant is going to be at a second temperature, as long as we know the delta H of reaction, the delta H zero of reaction, I ought to say. And delta H zero reaction, we know how to get that number, right? We can use uh, enthalpies of formation, and calculate it that way. We can measure that number using a calorimeter. So we just need to get our hands on that number, measure the equilibrium constant at one temperature, and we can use this to predict it at anything else. So this is a, is a very useful equation because we want to be able to predict at different temperatures what the equilibrium constant might be. You know, like let's say we have an equilibrium that at room temperature gives us high yields of product but the reaction is super slow. It takes a long time to establish that equilibrium. As a chemist who's 
already done the kinetics chapter, the first solution in your head, if if a reaction is too slow, is let's heat this sucker up. Let's increase the temperature. That'll make the reaction faster. But it'll also change the position of the equilibrium. So we want to know if you want to do that, if you want to crank up the temperature and therefore produce more products, will the equilibrium still lie in favor of the products? Will we still be getting the yields that we're expecting to get when this is all said and done? Van't Hoff equation in this form answers that question for us. All right. So actually, another thing that it allows us to do, which I, I didn't mention, is if you measure the equilibrium constant at one temperature, and then remeasure the equilibrium constant at a second temperature, we can use this equation and that data to calculate delta H uh, zero, standard delta H of reaction. So now we have a third way of getting delta H, right? We have enthalpies of formation, we have calorimetry, so measure it in the calorimeter. I guess we got a third one we, we did, which was the bond enthalpy, so although we said that was approximate, uh, which it is. But now we can use the Van Hoff equation, which is, I guess, a fourth way if we just measure if we're able to measure equilibrium constants, um, which we can do for gases using pressures and so on. Perfect. We'll do a problem. The equilibrium constant for the reaction 2NO2 is in equilibrium with N2O4. It was measured at two different temperatures and uh, we got the equilibrium constants K at both of those different values. Okay. So, so I have the numbers here written out somewhere. Let me make sure I got them. Okay. So we're just going to use that Van Hoff equation. Let's see if I have room underneath here. We have the natural log of K2 over K1 is equal to negative delta R H0 over the gas constant R, 1 minus 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Um, we can rearrange this to say delta R H0 is equal to the negative um, ln K2 over K1 multiplied by R and divided by 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Okay, so this is just a rearrangement of that initial equation. So let's stick some numbers in minus natural log K2. So what we can say is this will be uh, T1, T2, K1, K2. It actually doesn't matter at all which one you pick as K1 or K2, as long as you're consistent, as long as T1 goes with K1, we could call that K2, K1. The, 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 the formula works either way, and we'll give you the same result. So our K2, then I guess we're saying is 13.1 over 33.2 times R, which is 8.314 joules per K mol. And that's divided by one over T2 is 293.2 K minus one over 282.2 K. And there's no unknowns. We just calculate this out and we end up getting negative uh, 5.81 times 10 to the 4 joules per mole. The k's here will cancel with the k there, leave you in joules per mole, which is good because joules per mole is the unit that we're used to for delta H. Negative 58.1 kilojoules per mole. Cool. So we now know the uh, enthalpy of reaction. This is going to be an exothermic reaction in the forward direction because we have a negative delta H value. And all we had to do was measure two equilibrium constants, um, 
which you can measure in this example just by using total pressures. Right, so like if you started with a pressure of like, I don't know, 5.00 bar, uh, all you have to do is, is set this to one of these temperatures, 28.2, and then measure the total pressure. And once you know the total pressure, you can work out um, the partial pressures of NO2 and N2O4 using the exact same um, concept as we did in the first problem we did in this class. Right, that was, which problem was that? No, I'm not going to go through all that. Um, then you do, you change it to a second temperature, measure the total pressure again, and then that allows you to calculate your delta H. There we go. We have four methods of calculating the delta H zero for a chemical reaction. Fantoff gives us an additional one. All right, I'm going to stop here. We are at 9.20 and we are pretty much out of time. So we will continue it next Monday. Um, please keep an eye out for an email from me once I get the poll up to see who's able to come in person uh, next Wednesday and, and interested in that. Otherwise, have a great weekend and yeah, we'll see you all on Monday.